1969. That's exactly what it was called. We'll leave this briefing at this point as the U.S. Senate is meeting to continue debate on a non-binding measure saying those earning more than a million dollars a year should contribute more to the federal debt reduction. And now to live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. since the Watergate scandal that the Senate has canceled its July 4th recess. And the reason is so that we can continue working on this issue of uh, reducing our deficit and our debt and from my point of view, and I know I speak for many, doing it in a way that doesn't savage our senior citizens, our children, our families, our environment, our economic growth. And doing it in a way that's fair. It's fair so that we want, don't wind up with people like Warren Buffett or Donald Trump paying more in effective tax rate than their secretaries or a nurse or a firefighter. That's why we're here. That's why I'm here. Now, I want to apologize to my constituents in California. I had to cancel several events that were scheduled, but we will do that certainly in another time. It is critical to end the current standoff, and that, it seems to me, means sticking to three principles. First, we must agree that great nations do not default on their debt and both sides need to compromise so that that doesn't happen. Nobody gets everything they want in a compromise. I speak as a senator, a former House member, a former county supervisor, a mother, a grandmother, a daughter. The fact is, you don't get everything you want if you're truly negotiating and compromising. You don't take your marbles and go home. You don't take your little teddy bear and leave. You stick with it. And you understand that in true compromise, everyone gives just a little bit. Now let's look at the government as it is today, as the people wanted it. They decided they wanted a Democratic president, and we have one in President Obama. They, de they decided they wanted a Republican House of Representatives, and they have that. And they decided they wanted a Democratic United States Senate, and they have that. So you have the three arms, and two-thirds of them are controlled by Democrats and one by Republicans. If I then said, because of this, I want two-thirds of what Democrats want, I could have a leg like to stand on. But I'm not even saying that. I'm saying let's meet each other halfway. And that's the fair, that's very fair. And I think most Americans of independent mind would think so. This is not a parliamentary system. In a parliamentary system that we see around the world, the ruling party gets everything they want and the others get to talk. And maybe they can somehow work themselves into the equation. So first and foremost, we need to compromise. Second, we need to take a lesson from history and follow what worked the last time we balanced the budget in the mid-90s, the early to mid-90s. And believe me, we did it. With President Clinton, we did it. We passed a budget that some of my friends on the Republican side said would be a disaster. It would never balance. It did. As a matter of fact, it produced surpluses. We passed the budget without one Republican vote that laid out the plan that some of my Republican friends said, we're going to go into a depression. We went into the longest period of sustained economic growth and 23 to 24 million jobs created. So we know how to do this because guess what? We did it before. We had a plan. It cut unnecessary spending. It asked the upper income people, the very wealthiest among us, to pay a fair share. And it created all those jobs and we had surpluses. But our friends on the other side say, don't talk to us about that. We don't want to talk about it. We have to talk about it. Because otherwise you're going to do what the Republicans did to the seniors in their house budget, which is to end Medicare as we know it, and to put the burden of all this on their backs and on the backs of the middle class. So 
First, we need to compromise. Second, we need to do what works, cut the things that you don't need, invest the things that will create the jobs, and ask the wealthy to pay, the, pay their fair share. Third, we have to put our country ahead of politics. And let me show you a couple of very interesting recent uh, editorial comments. Actually, they were yesterday, as I, or the day before. Yesterday, actually. Here, let's put it lower. This is USA Today. Republican rigidity on taxes threatens to torpedo debt, debt deal. Republican rigidity on taxes threatens to torpedo debt deal. If the GOP walkout is anything more than a negotiating tactic, it is breathtakingly irresponsible considering the risks of default. The nation has used trillions of dollars in borrowed money to finance two wars, Medicare's prescription drug program, and President Bush's broad tax cuts, all initiated with the GOP controlling both the White House and the Congress. Now Republicans have belatedly decided borrowing is bad too, but they dogmatically resist even the most sensible and painless tax hikes. This says it all, Mr. President, the USA Today. Then there's an article, then there's a David Brooks, a leading Republican columnist who said, if the debt ceiling talks fail, independent voters will see that Democrats were willing to compromise, but Republicans were not. If responsible Republicans do not take control, independents will conclude that Republican fanaticism caused this default. They will conclude that Republicans are not fit to govern, and they will be right. This is written by a leading Republican, well, actually, I'd call him a, a leading intellect in the Republican Party. So we see here that people on the outside are noticing what's happening. You cannot take your marbles and go home when the full faith and credit of the United States of America is at stake. Now, a lot of people think raising the debt ceiling is so you can do more spending in the future. No, no. <laughs> raising the debt ceiling is to take care of the debts that were incurred in the past. Two wars unpaid for, a huge tax cut to the millionaires and the billionaires unpaid for, a prescription drug benefit unpaid for, while my Republican friends said, know that Medicare could not negotiate for lower prescription drug prices. So the cost of it's going, you know, just through the roof. So if we don't, if we don't put revenues on the table, if we don't talk about closing those tax loopholes, those benefits to the millionaires and billionaires, all the cuts go on the middle class, and all you have to do is look at the Ryan budget that passed the House to understand what's going to happen if we don't do this. Now, the Republicans had this budget and they gave it a name they, over there in the House. The Path to Prosperity, Restoring America's Promise. Well, I took some liberties and I wrote my own title. It's, I think their budget is the Path to Poverty, Breaking America's Promise, because that's what that budget does. The Republican budget would end Medicare as we know it, a 65-year-old who becomes eligible for Medicare would pay more than $12,000 in health care costs the first year the plan goes into effect, twice is what they pay under current law. Imagine a senior citizen, a grandma, a great-grandma, who maybe lives off her Social Security. Suddenly, she's paying $6,000 for her health care. Suddenly, she's paying $12,000. Well, that might as well just tell her she might as well forget it. She just has to get down on her knees and pray that she doesn't get sick. The Republican budget, but since that wasn't enough to pay for tax cuts for their rich friends, they cut Medicaid by 49% by 2030. They cut Pell Grant, and by the way, that's, a lot of that's nursing homes, paying for nursing homes, for the poorest of the poor. The Republican budget would cut education grant awards by half, 1.4 million students would lose access to financial aid. That's what this country has been about, giving hope to our young people. And hope means an education. Pell Grants cut in half. They say over and over again, Washington doesn't have a tax problem. 
we have a spending problem. Well, let's take a look at that. If you look at non-defense discretionary over the years, what you find out when you add in inflation, it hasn't grown at all, while the military spending has gone up 74 percent. So clearly, uh, we have a road map just with fairness we can get to where we have to get. Let's not keep cutting the things we've already cut. Let's cut the waste, let's cut the fraud, let's cut the abuse, and let's cut these tax expenditures. I'd ask for an additional five minutes and then I'll yield to my friend from Utah. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. So, defense spending, they may look at it, but they're not happy about it, even though it's gone up 74% over the last 10 years. Now, again, we should look at Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett made the point that he paid only 17.7% .7 tax. He paid only a 17.7% .7 tax on his $46 million in earnings, while his receptionist paid 30% on her wages. Imagine. In 2008, the 400 richest income tax filers paid an effective rate of about 18%. Take ExxonMobil. They paid an effective rate of 18% on $7 billion, whereas the average family making a combined 100000 had a higher effective rate. Let's give tax breaks to the middle class, not to the wealthiest who have everything and more, whose children's 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 children will be fine. This is America. This isn't pre-revolutionary France where the king had everything. If there's a family supported by two teachers and they make $106,000, they had a higher tax rate than ExxonMobil. But yet and still, if you look around the country at Republican legislators and governors, they're going after the teachers. They're so wealthy while the people who are making the millions and the billions, they're just giving more and more to. I don't understand it. It's trickle down. Somehow somebody will spend something at the very top and it will trickle down. That's all fine. But they have enough to trickle down already. We don't have to add to it. A family supported by a truck driver and a dental hygienist made a combined 107,000 had a higher tax rate than Exxon Mobil. The tax break for corporate jets is $3 billion a year over, it's $3 billion over 10 years. Subsidies to the biggest five oil companies costing us $21 billion over 10 years. So what I'm saying is we don't have to balance the budget on the backs of the senior citizens who need their Medicare, on the students who need their Pell Grants. We don't need to do that. I'm the chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee. The House budget which I say breaks America's promise, is so bad on transportation, it cuts 36% across the board. And thousands and thousands of construction workers, whether they're in Utah or California or Maryland or you name your town, your city, will be cut. This in an area where there's been so much unemployment because of the housing crisis that you could fill 20 Super Bowl stadiums with unemployed construction workers. Two million. That's how many there are. So look at what President Clinton did. He increased taxes on the wealthiest. He created tax incentives for small business. He invested in education, retirement saving, research and development. The Republicans fought us tooth and nail. As a matter of fact, Senator Grassley said at the time, I really do not, do not think it takes a rocket scientist to know this bill will cost jobs. That's what he said, created 24 million jobs, 23 million on the low side, in surpluses of $236 billion. So let me just conclude by saying this. This is a tough time in our history. We are at the precipice for the first time in my lifetime of hearing threats of defaulting on the full faith and credit of America. When we lift the debt ceiling, we do it in order to pay for the debts that were incurred. And sadly for us, after having a surplus under Bill Clinton, the policies of George W. Bush caused us to go into deep, deep holes in the deficit and the debt. We were on the way
to a great place. But I remember, never forget it, when George W. came out and he said, I think that these uh, surpluses we're running belong to the American people, and what he really meant, the, um, the rich people, because that's who got the lion's share of that. So we can keep the tax rates low for the middle class. We can make sure the wealthy pay their fair share. We can come to the table and negotiate in, with, a, with an open heart and an open mind, and knowing well that we won't get everything each of us wants. Um, I will close by reading a quote from Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, who in 1983 wrote the following. The full consequences of a default by the United States, and even, he said, the serious prospect of a default, are impossible to predict and awesome to contemplate. Denigration of the full faith and credit of the United States would have substantial effects on the domestic financial markets and on the value of the dollar in exchange markets. The nation can ill afford to allow such a result. That's the end of the quote. President Reagan was right. It's time to stop playing politics with this of the, the greatest country that gave us everything we've ever hoped for. And I say to Americans, call the Senate. Ask for a fair budget plan with the parties meeting each other halfway. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield the floor. President? <coughs> Senator from Utah is recognized. Mr. President, it's uh, nice to hear asking for a fair budget plan, but we haven't had a budget from this uh, administration now. And how many days is it? Almost 800 days? I mean, uh, they've got control of the Senate, and yet we haven't seen a budget from this administration. I can ask consent that I be permitted to speak as long as I have to here. Objection. Senator is recognized. I appreciate that. You know, I, I get a little tired of hearing the Obama approach towards shared sacrifice. Shared sacrifice uh, is something. Sounds good. But I'd prefer the Republican approach to shared prosperity. And that's what I think we're all about. And when you talk about shared sacrifice, think about this. It's pretty irrefutable that the bottom 51% of all wage earners, of all households, do not pay income taxes. The top 1% of the so-called wealthy pay 38% of all income taxes. The top 10 percent are paying 70 percent of all income taxes. The top 50 percent pay somewhere near 98 percent of all income taxes. 51 percent don't pay anything. But Democrats say, well, but they pay payroll taxes. Well, everybody does that because that's Social Security. And they pay about one-third of what they're going to take out over the years in Social Security. Why, Obamacare a family of four earning over $80,000 a year gets subsidies. Think about that. And that's what we call the poor. And they wonder why the monies don't go far enough. When are we going to wake up and realize that the other side just spends and spends and spends and they want to tax and tax and tax so they can spend some more? My gosh, when are we going to wake up in this country and realize they're spending us into oblivion? And I hear how they're so caring for the poor and so forth. The poor need jobs. And they also need to share some of the responsibility. Now, we don't want the really poor people who are in poverty to have to pay income taxes, but 51% of all households, and that's going up, by the way, because of our friend down in the White House and his allies. I wish I didn't like him so much. I'd like to really be able to let go here. But I like him personally. And I want him to be successful. But he's not going to be successful by just taxing the daylights out of everybody around here. Now, Mr. President, this Congress is currently engaged in as consequential a political debate as this nation has seen in decades. Whether and under what conditions we raise the, the nation's debt ceiling is a question that has consumed the markets in the nation. I serve the people of Utah, and I hear about this issue every day, the sustainability of a government that has grown far beyond any reasonable or constitutional limits, and the cost of paying for all of this government is foremost in the minds of taxpaying citizens who will be left 
holding the bag even when President Obama is back in Hyde Park and members of Congress no longer serve. The decision to spend lasts only for a moment, but the debt incurred to pay for these government programs lasts forever. 51% of all households don't pay income taxes. Now the Democrats say, well, they pay payroll taxes. Yeah, they do. Everybody does, because that's Social Security. And 23 million of them get refundable tax credits that are more than they pay in payroll taxes. Well, I wish I could report to my constituents that Washington is serious about addressing the spending problem. Unfortunately, in the last week, we seem to have hit a new low. President Obama's contribution last week was a press conference slash temper tantrum where he offered up policy proposals that might appeal to his left-wing base, but will do nothing to avoid our coming national bankruptcy. Not to be outdone, Democratic leadership in the Senate has now offered up a non-binding resolution designed solely to score some cheap political points that will jazz up the activist left through demagogic class warfare against individuals with high incomes. He's going to raise $3 billion over 10 years by taxing jet planes. It'd take 1,000 years to reach what we're spending, on, uh, what, what, we, what we have as a deficit this year, just from that one tax to, to, to jack up enough money to pay for just a deficit this year. Well, facing a full-blown debt crisis, this is how Democrat, the Senate Democrats, following the President's lead, have chosen to spend this week debating a non-binding resolution. Episodes like this leave me convinced that the only real solution to our nation's spending problem is a balanced budget constitutional amendment. Only a specific constitutional restraint will force Congress to make the tough decisions necessary to restrain the size of government, restore the integrity of the states, and protect the liberties of the American citizens and taxpayers. To demonstrate my commitment to restoring constitutional limits on the federal government, I have signed the Cut, Cap, and Balance Pledge. Along with a growing number of my colleagues in the Senate, members of the House, grassroots groups, and presidential candidates, I have committed myself to cutting spending, capping spending, and passing a balanced budget constitutional amendment as a condition for any debt limit increase. As this debate over how best to address our growing debt and annual deficits continues, I want to address a technical but critical matter in these negotiations, and I'm talking about tax expenditures. I'm ranking on the Senate Finance Committee, and I know a little bit about these. Over the next few days, I'm going to discuss this matter of tax expenditures in depth. Today, I'm going to talk in general about what a tax expenditure is and what a tax expenditure is not. I will next turn to the tax policy areas implicated by current tax expenditures. For instance, home ownership is favored in our tax base with a tax expenditure. There is a deduction for home mortgage interest, a deduction for real property taxes, and an exclusion for income from home sales. The tax code, these are tax expenditures. The tax code also encourages charitable contributions. Charitable deductions are available to citizens when they give to a nonprofit crisis, re crisis pregnancy center, when they put money in the basket at church, or when they give to their alma mater, just to mention a few charitable donations. In a third speech, I will attempt to shed some light on a widespread misconception about tax expenditures. That misconception is that tax expenditures disproportionately benefit high-income taxpayers. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. My remarks today are remarks about what a tax expenditure is. Unfortunately, my remarks are also largely about Democrats' plans to increase taxes. President Obama and his liberal allies are calling for a balanced approach and a revenue piece to deficit reduction. They want shared sacrifice. I want shared prosperity. We hear this from the press all the time. New revenues need to be a part of any deal to reduce the deficit. These are simply code words for a tax hike. And I guarantee you, if we t raise taxes, my friends on the other side will spend every dime of it. That's how they've kept themselves in power and then claiming that they're helping the poor. Well, are 51% of our households so poor that they can't participate in saving this country? It is clear that the professional left is insisting that President Obama include tax increases in any negotiated agreement to raise the debt ceiling. 
Threading this tax hike needle through an electorate resistant to giving money, giving the government more money to spend is no easy task. Though his campaign team talks a big game about the popularity of tax increases, the president's own words suggest otherwise. Last week, in a shameful display of class warfare, the president did specifically call for some tax increases on the rich. That includes 800,000 small businesses, by the way, where 70% of the jobs come from. But that is the exception that proves the rule. By and large, the president avoids the effectual truth of his mission to get rid of tax expenditures. Massive tax increases on the middle class American families to whom he promised immunity from tax increases when he was running for president. Instead, he and other members of the party of tax increases refer to tax expenditures as spending through the tax code. How seriously should we take his rhetoric? Well, when the president said that he wanted to address the nation's debt by reducing spending through the tax code, it proved too much for even John Stewart. This was Stewart's analysis of the president's contention that we could reduce the deficit by attacking spending through the tax code. Quote, you managed to talk about a tax hike as a spending reduction. Can we afford that and the royalty checks you're going to have to send to George Orwell? That's the weirdest way of just say tax hike. That's like saying I'm not going on a diet. I'm going to add calories to my excluded food intake, unquote. That was John Stewart. He hit the nail on the head. For sure, it's easy to make fun, but what the president is trying to do with tax expenditures is no laughing matter. Liberals talk about tax expenditures as though they were just getting rid of wasteful spending. First, as a legal matter, tax expenditures are not spending. Outlays or checks cut from the Treasury Department are defined as spending under the Congressional Budget Act. That's what spending is. Yet most tax expenditures only lose revenue and do not include an outlay uh, portion. Tax expenditures that only lose revenue contain no spending as defined by the Congressional Budget Act and is scored by the official scorekeepers for Congress, the Joint Committee on Taxation and the Congressional Budget Office. And second, as a policy matter, when it comes to tax expenditures, one person's loophole is another person's opportunity to save for college and retirement, finance a home, and tithe to your church. Here's the bottom line. Taking away or reducing tax expenditures is a tax increase, unless a tax cut of, equal, of an equal or greater amount is enacted. One crucial myth that I would like to dispel is that tax expenditures are spending. This chart, revenue loss, does not equal spending. The federal government cannot spend money that it never touched and never possessed. What tax expenditures do is let taxpayers, taxpayers keep more of their money, of their own money. The American people are the ones that earn their money through their ideas, their risk, and their labor. Whether you are a successful business owner or a part-time worker just starting out, the money that you earn is yours. It is your money. And only by your consent is the government permitted to take some of it in taxation to pay for certain public goods. But Democrats have a different view, and, and it is this view, one that is fundamentally at odds with our classical liberal constitution and our founders' respect for property rights that contributes to the confusion over tax expenditures. Liberals think that all of the money that you earn belongs to the government. You have no independent right to the fruit of your own labors because only by dint of big government are you ever able to make something of yourself. This view is foreign to most Americans, Republicans or Democrats. It is a view that Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin and Abraham Lincoln would take issue with. But this is the political philosophy of the modern left. So when you hear tax hike proponents come to the Senate floor and say, we're giving these businesses and individuals all this money in tax expenditures, they are incorrectly assuming that the government has that money to give in the first place. The government does not have this money to give. That money belongs first to the people that earn it, those businesses and individuals that are American taxpayers. There are critical differences between spending and tax expenditures. For one thing, the government never touches the money that a taxpayer keeps due to benefiting from a tax expenditure, whereas with spending, the government actually collects money from the taxpayers and then it spends it. 
Here's a more telling difference. Reducing or eliminating a tax expenditure without lowering rates enough to reach a revenue neutral level will cause the size of the federal government to grow, while reducing or eliminating spending causes the size of the federal government to shrink. Now, I am open to looking at eliminating or reducing some tax expenditures as part of comprehensive tax reform, but only if tax rates are lowered enough to reach a revenue neutral level. Alternatively, reduction or elimination of tax expenditures could be balanced with new tax cuts that are of equal or greater value to the revenue generated by the eliminated expenditures. But if tax expenditures are reduced or eliminated without tax rates being lowered enough to reach a revenue neutral level, that is a tax increase, plain and simple. We have made clear that as a matter of law and political theory, tax expenditures are not spending. Now let's turn to an examination of what they are. Fortunately, we do have the definitions available. The Joint Committee on Taxation generally defines tax expenditures as deliberate departures from generally accepted concepts of net income, usually by way of special exemptions, deductions, credits, or exclusions. Therefore, tax expenditures generally arise for individual income taxes and corporate income taxes. The Treasury Department differs from the Joint Committee on Taxation slightly in how it defines a tax expenditure. For example, the Joint Committee on Taxation labels deferral as a tax expenditure, but Treasury does not. But whichever definition one uses, it is clear that the President and the liberal proponents of tax increases are using their own politically motivated dictionary. Tax expenditures have been erroneously described as many, uh, by many as, quote, loopholes, unquote. This is deliberately inaccurate. A loophole is something that Congress did not intend and would generally shut down at least going forward once it learned of the loophole. Tax expenditures, by contrast, were generally placed by Congress into the tax code deliberately. For example, the largest tax expenditure is the exclusion for employer-provided health insurance and benefits. That's a tax expenditure. The second largest tax expenditure is the home mortgage interest deduction. We all know why they're there, and they're there for good reason. Tax expenditures are not loopholes. We're not talking here about some fancy tax scheme that a lawyer or accountant has discovered and now promotes to his clients as a way to game the system. These are broad-based tax incentives that benefit many Americans. The deduction for charitable contributions is not some loophole. It was a deliberate inclusion in the code that acknowledges the need for religious citizens to contribute to their churches. Even some of the smaller dollar tax expenditures were designed by Congress to go to particular industries or types of taxpayers. For example, the tax expenditure to encourage the purchase of corporate jets that Democrats included in the stimulus and that the President is now criticizing. Now, whether you agree with these particular tax expenditures or not, an honest debate requires recognition that they were designed by Congress with economic and social goals in mind and are not inadvertent loopholes. As a matter of law, policy, and constitutional government, I fundamentally disagree with those who are pushing these tax increases as part of a deal to raise the debt limit or the debt ceiling. Our problem is spending that has grown out of control, not the lack of revenue. According to CBO's June 2011 long-term budget outlook, taxes are already heading higher than they have historically been. From 1971 to 2010, revenues as a percentage of GDP have averaged 18 percent. Since the post-World War II era from 1946 to 2010, revenues have averaged 17.7 percent of GDP. Yet CBA also projects that revenues as a percentage of GDP will exceed 20 percent by 2021. Even if all the bipartisan tax relief contained in the 2001 and 2003 tax acts is extended, Revenues as a percentage of GDP will increase to 18.4 percent. So I ask the question, with taxes already going higher than where they have historically been, should we raise them even more? For me, the answer is no. I know that most Utahns would, would agree, and I believe most people in this country would agree. And I suspect that even most Democrats would as well. They certainly would if President Obama and the liberals who pose as advocates for the middle class came clean 
about just how high taxes would have to go on working families to pay for the hardcore left's preferred level of government. The numbers don't lie. The deficit is a symptom of out-of-control spending that has grown dramatically in recent years and is reaching crisis levels. It is not a result of too little in taxes. Democrats can close all the loopholes they want, and it still won't balance the books. And the Democrats who are talking about the need to close loopholes and eliminate spending through the tax code need to be asked which middle-class tax relief they want to get rid of as part of their deficit reduction plan. Do they want to get rid of the charitable deduction? Or maybe the mortgage interest deduction? Maybe they want to go after people's 401Ks or IRAs or 529s. What's it going to be? Now, let me just say something here. I'm really concerned about where we're going. We've risen this year to 25.3% of GDP in spending. Last time we hit that figure was in 1945 at the height of the Second World War when the government was taking over almost everything to keep us from losing that war. It's certainly over 23% right now. What's it going to be? At his press event slash tantrum last week, the president abs answered absolutely none of these questions. None! He needs to. Otherwise, he needs to get serious about cutting spending. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of the floor. The clerk will call the roll of the Senate. Mr. Kaka. Mr. President, the Senator from Utah. I ask uh, that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection, Senator. I ask consent that the division of time under the quorum call be divided equally. Without objection. I thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll of the Senate. Mr. Akaka. 
senator from uh, Arkansas. Unanimous consent that the quorum be dispensed with without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, it's been almost 800 days since the Senate Democratic majority has produ produced a budget pr proposal. I don't expect one to appear from the majority today, but at least the Democratic majority canceled the 4th of July week recess to work toward an agreement to deal with our budgetary crisis. With the possibility of default looming, our caucus, led by Senator Sessions, has been pushing the Democratic majority to keep the chamber working over the recent recesses. After refusing past calls to remain in session, the Democratic majority finally recognized that we can't sort this out if we aren't here to focus on it. I, for one, am glad that the Democratic majority listened. The American people deserve an honest, open conversation about the very difficult situation that we are in. More importantly, they deserve a commitment that we will work in good faith to end this impasse. Unfortunately, I'm not sure we will get that from the Democratic majority or the President. We are in session this week specifically to deal with the budget ceiling crisis. And the only vote the majority leader had scheduled from the outset was a resolution on the Libya conflict. I say had because the Democratic majority rightly canceled that vote after intense pressure from our side to keep the Senate focused on the debt ceiling issue. And President Obama has been absent from this de debate for months. Only recently, he started showing up to tell Americans that his solution to the crisis is raising taxes instead of cutting spending. Meanwhile, we've inched closer and closer to towards defaulting on our obligations. It's interesting that we are here today specifically to work out a solution to our financial crisis one week after scenes of Athens on fire as a result of rioting over Greece's own debt crisis dominated the airwaves. One week after passing tough austerity measures to secure further financial aid, the very same measures that sparked the rioting, the Greek government is far from out of the woods. Standard & Poor's says the proposals for restructuring Greek debt would effectively constitute a default instead of helping the country avoid one. So I mention all of this not to generate fear, but rather to shed light on the gravity of our situation. We could very well end up like Greece if we do not handle this crisis properly. This is the last thing we want to experience in our great country, and that is why we need to reform our fiscal policy and the way that we've done business in the past. There is too much at stake not to take action now. We're at a point where our nation can no longer borrow money. The IMF has harsh words for our soaring budget deficits and credit rating agencies like Moody's and S&P have threatened to downgrade our government AAA rating. President Obama likes to blame our economic mess on the previous administration, but the reality is over the past two years, our debt has increased 35 percent under his watch that's not the previous administration's fault, nor is it their fault that the annual deficit is now three times greater than the highest deficit during the Bush years. If American families ran their households like Washington runs its budget, the utilities would be shut off and collection agencies would be knocking on their doors. If they, mixed, if they maxed out a credit card, they wouldn't have the luxury of telling someone else to pay for their bills. Yet this is what the President is demanding by sticking to tax increase proposals. I said this continues to push tax increases as the answer. I will say it again. President Obama, take tax hikes off the table. We got into this mess by excessively spending. We can't fix the problem unless we stop excessively spending. But the White House remains focused on tax hikes. If you look at their agenda, you can see why. The big ticket items they've already passed, specifically the President's stimulus and health care bills, have put our country on the path of unprecedented levels of spending that will keep us in the red for my lifetime, my children's lives, and well beyond. The administration's refusal to cut excessive spending, much of which the nation never asked for, 
will put us on the course for a Greek-like catastrophe. Without action, annual interest payments on the national debt alone will exceed 40 percent of GDP by 2080. So with that in mind, the President is working behind closed doors with his allies in Congress to figure out ways to raise revenue. As we all know, revenue is a Washington euphemism for taxes. Instead of further ex exasperating our economy by raising taxes and putting us in a position that it will affect our recovery and our nation's future. Mr. President, the, the solution must be tethered on the problem. Washington does not have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. Any proposal that does not start in that truth should be taken off the table. If the White House engineered agreement for raising the debt ceiling does not include significant cuts and a spending cap mechanism, such as a balanced budget amendment, to prevent us from having to raise it again, then I can assure you they will not get my vote. Anything short of that is irresponsible. I know I'm not alone in these demands. Many of my colleagues feel just as strongly and will not back down either. The President and the Senate Democratic majority needs to understand we are committed to these principles because millions of Americans feel exactly the same as we do. We are here to do the people's work. Let's listen to them instead of trying to tell the people what's best for them. Uh, Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk called the roll of the Senate. Mr. Kaka.
thanks, President. I, um, July 5th, uh, we just went through the July 4th weekend celebrating our independence in 17, July 4th, 1776. July 5th, um, 76 years ago, uh, our country, something else happened pretty, very, very important in our country and very, very symbolic of what we stand for as a nation. I've heard the, the presiding officer from Maryland just talk a moment ago about the values we hold as a nation uh, and how important that is to convey those values uh, in everything we do in this body. And uh, what happened on July 5th, uh, 1935, was President Roosevelt signed something called the Nation National Labor Relations Act. And we know that what came out of the National Labor Relations Act and the other reforms of that era, in addition to Social Security uh, and some uh, the, the CCC and some other things, was the, the, the concept and the implementation of collective bargaining. And collective bargaining is a right that the American people have uh, to join voluntarily in, uh, in, a, in a collective bargaining unit, if you will, the, generally a labor union, and negotiate on behalf of hundreds or thousands of, of fellow workers wages and health care and pensions and other kinds of um, vacation days and other things like that. And I, I, I mention that today because just late last week in Ohio, uh, something remarkable happened uh, in my state of Ohio. In Columbus, in response to the state legislature taking away those collective bargaining rights and a radical departure from 75 years of, of collective bargaining national private sector success and 30 years of Ohio collective bargaining uh, for public employee success, the, 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 rad the legislature passed a radical act um, earlier this year to take away those collective bargaining rights for, for, private, for public employees. Uh, we know what that, we know it's a direct assault on the middle class. We know that it will mean declining, uh, shrinking middle class. We know that the biggest threat to this country today, to our economy and to our country and to our country's families, the biggest threat is, is that the middle class is, um, is shrinking and that the middle class is, is declining. So when the legislature and I call them radicals because it really is a direct hit, a direct violation of what we stand for as a nation, the right to organize and bargain collectively voluntarily. We have seen the, the, these public employees, and who knows what's next, have those rights taken away. And we know what will be next, prevailing wage, uh, I, all the, um, the right to work, all the kinds of things that, that pro-corporate conservative politicians have tried to do for some years. But, but we had, Mr. President, we basically had a, a, um, a consensus in this country, we had a consensus around Medicare, a consensus around minimum wage, a consensus about safe drinking water and clean air, a consensus about collective bargaining rights that, that 80, 90 percent of the country agreed on. And we then had, you know, we had disagreements on the edges on the environment or on, on safe drinking water or maybe some, some things on Medicare, but by and large there was, there was a consensus on what we did here. But, but what we saw earlier this year in Ohio was, this was an assault directly on those values. They're going after collective bargaining rights. In another piece of legislation, they're going after voter rights. In another piece of legislation, they're going after women's rights. In Washington, they're going after Medicare. Um, all of those kinds of things that we had a consensus on. But let me go back to the collective bargaining. So what happened last week, Mr. President, is something remarkable. In Ohio, unlike many states, you can actually, after a bill passes and becomes law signed by the governor, you have 90 days to gather signatures. Um, I believe in, in, in Ohio's case, it's a, you need about 250,000 signatures to place on the ballot a referendum. In other words, if this goes on the ballot, the voters have a chance to repeal that bill. So when the radicals in the legislature took away collective bargaining rights and the Republican governor signed it, a group of Ohio citizens put on the ballot a repeal of that, that taking away collective bargaining rights. They needed about 250,000 signatures. You know how many they got? They submitted last week 1.3 million signatures. 1.3 million people signed saying we want this to go on the ballot to repeal this radical measure that, that state legislative Republicans, and no Democrats in either party, in either House voted for this, to take away what they were doing, to repeal what they were doing. 1.3 million people in signatures. In fact, they brought a whole, they brought a whole truckload of, of boxes of signatures and in the Secretary of State's office they had to send in a structural engineer, literally, to make sure that the floor, I think it's on the 
14th floor, I don't recall for sure. But to make sure the floor could support the weight of these um, 1.3 million signatures. That tells me that, and I know uh, Senator Cardin and Senator Whitehouse, when they come to the floor, oftentimes talk about the overreach, the, the radical nature of what what conservative far-right politicians are doing in this country right now. The overreach, going after bargaining rights, going after Medicare, going after minimum wage, putting tax breaks and tax breaks are really earmarks for the rich in the tax code. All of these kinds of things they're trying to do and unravel so much of what we fought for as a nation for so many years. But the, the good news in Ohio this week, 1.3 million people said they've had enough. We're not going to stand for this. We're not going to tolerate this radical overreach that Governor Kasich and legislators are doing in Columbus and House Republicans and far too many members of the Senate are doing in this body. Mr. President, that's good news. I think we move forward from there. Um, I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Maryland. First, let me thank Senator from Ohio, Senator Brown, for his leadership uh, for working families. Uh, we were colleagues in the House of Representatives and there was no more effective voice on behalf of working families and, and then Congressman Brown, now Senator Brown. And I just want to thank him for bringing these issues to, to our attention. Uh, you're absolutely right. There's been an all-out assault on the dignity of working families in this country uh, at all levels. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the budget deliberations because I believe here also we find an assault upon middle-income families. And uh, as President Kennedy said, to govern is to choose. And we've never had a, a clearer choice of two different visions of America. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I know we're all working hard to, to reach a, a, a fair compromise and I'm one of those who believe that the, the final agreement will not be what the Democrats want or what the Republicans want. We're going to have to do a compromise. But I think people in this nation need to know the type of choices that we're making here in Washington. Uh, I see the Republicans who are, uh, heard some of the speeches that just recently given on the floor who are really trying to protect the very wealthy, the millionaires. In the Republican budget, millionaires would get another $200,000 of tax cuts. Where at the same time, that budget would cost our seniors who live on fixed incomes an extra $6,000 a year in health care costs if their plan on Medicare were to become law. That's, that's the type of choices that we're being asked to make here. Being asked to, to continue uh, the gas subsidies, the, uh, the tax subsidies for the five big biggest uh, gas companies in this country. That's what the Republican budget would protect. They would protect those tax breaks. Let me just remind you that those five companies in the last decade made a trillion dollars. Profits. That during the time that we saw escalating gas prices here and our economy being hurt by it, people couldn't afford to fill up their cars with gasoline. They couldn't afford to fill up the tanks. And yet at the same time, those five oil companies had record profits. So we say let's take away the government subsidies. And yet the choice for our Republican friends is to say no, we, we, we can't do that. Instead they look at cutting nutrition programs and Pell Grants to make it more expensive for children to be able to go to college or nutrition programs to try to have a healthier America. Well, what we're pushing for is a balanced approach in how we deal with this budget deficit. We could talk a long time how we got here. The policies of the previous administration was just uh, 10 years ago we had these large surpluses. And the previous administration cut taxes not once but twice. Second time using a credit card in order to pay for those tax cuts. Went to war not in one country but in two countries. Use a credit card in order to pay for those wars. And wondering why we have all this debt today. Well. It's our responsibility to take care of this deficit because this deficit is affecting the strength of America. And we know that we need to have a balanced approach in order to do it. I, along with the presiding officer, are members of the Budget Committee. We're working hard on the Budget Committee to come up with a way that we can do it. The Democrats on that committee are united that there's a better way than the Republican budget that came over from the House of Representatives. Let me just talk a little bit about... Uh, whether this is a class warfare. I've heard that mentioned many times. And this might surprise you. I might agree with my Republican friends. I think the Republican budget is an attack on class. The Center for Budget and Policy Priorities said, and I'll quote, that with the, about the Republican budget, 
it would produce the largest redistribution of income from the bottom to the top in modern U.S. history. We're asking the poor and working families to contribute so the wealthy can get more tax breaks. That's just wrong. What we want to see is a balanced approach. Approach that says, look, this deficit's very serious. We've got to ask and, and save money wherever we can to balance the federal budget. Starts with looking at our domestic spending. And we've been willing to say, look, programs that are not high priority programs, we're going to have to cut back on those programs. Programs that aren't working, we're going to have to eliminate. Duplicate programs, let's get rid of. And we said we're ready, we're prepared to do that. But we also got to look at our at the non-domestic programs, our military programs, our security programs. We know that we're in the process now of bringing our combat troops home from Afghanistan. That can produce savings. Let's use that to reduce the budget deficit. There are ways that we can get this deficit down. And then I was listening to one of my colleagues on our side, I'll talk about the so-called tax expenditures. So let me put this in context for one moment. Our tax code spends about $1.4 trillion a year in special provisions that give special breaks to different taxpayers. I think none of us are saying that all these should be eliminated. But we are saying that when you find tax loopholes, when you find shelters, when you find tax havens, let's get rid of them. Now, I've, I've, I've taken the floor to talk about two areas where I think there's broad consensus. The ethanol subsidy, we don't need it any longer. It's questionable whether we ever needed it. The industry will do just fine without the subsidy, but let me tell you what the subsidy causes. It causes my poultry farmers in Maryland to pay a lot more for their corn, costing jobs in Maryland. So there's a tax subsidy that we can get rid of. We had, we had a vote on the floor. And it was quite obvious that the majority, the overwhelming majority agree with that. Why can't we use that for deficit reduction? We talked about the gas industry. Why are we giving them subsidies? There's no need for that. So we can take those shelters, we can take those tax heavens, we can take those loopholes and use that. And yes, I think there is a question why millionaires are going to continue to get a tax cut that was meant to be temporary in nature, when we, when we need as much revenue as we can to pay off our bills. I think there is a, an issue here whether that's fair. How do we tell students they have to pay more for college? How do we tell families that fewer will be able to go to Head Start programs? How do we tell our seniors they have to pay more, and yet we tell the millionaires they're going to get additional tax cuts? That's just not fair, and it doesn't make good sense for our economy. So there's a better way. I know my colleague from Rhode Island is going to speak next. He also serves on the Budget Committee. Well, the Democrats, are, we have a better way of doing this. We know how we can reduce the budget deficit by even more than the Simpson-Bowles Deficit Commission did, where we can bring in the deficit and bring it under control to make it a reasonable amount of our economy rather than uncontrolled as it is today. We can do that by bringing in not just domestic spending, but also our defense spending in order to reduce more spending in this country. We can do that. And we can do it in a way that protects the integrity of Medicare. We don't want our seniors at the risk of private insurance companies. We don't want private insurance companies telling our seniors when they can get care and when they can't. We tried that before we created Medicare. We know the problems that were created by that. So our budget, we want to protect the integrity of Social Security and Medicare and the programs that are critically important to our seniors. We will close the tax loopholes. We will eliminate shelters. We will make sure that everybody is part of the solution. And we can do it in a way that will help build this great nation. Let me just tell you what our objectives are, quite frankly. Our objectives is to manage our deficit, to bring it down, to bring it under control in a real way, to protect those who are most vulnerable in our community, and to invest in America's future so we can create more jobs, so that we can continue to build our roads, our bridges, our water systems in this country, so that we can continue to invest in education. And yes, so we can protect our federal workforce, 
and pay them decent salaries and compensation benefits. We can do all that. But, Mr. President, if we're going to get the job done, Democrats and Republicans have to be honest in their debate and their compromise. It will not be what one side wants. We're going to have to compromise for the good of the American people. I took the time today to share with the people of Maryland and the nation where I believe our vision should be in regards to the budget of this nation. I hope we're able to achieve those objectives because I really do believe our children and grandchildren's future depends upon us getting this right. And if we work together, we can pass a budget that's in the best interest of the American people, allow our economy to grow, to create jobs, which is the best answer to deal with our deficit. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor.